This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Something about tigers. Sometimes we begin a script with little idea of what we'll be talking about. Mostly we just write whatever comes to mind until some sort of idea strikes us and we can begin chasing it down. Oh sure, we've got a list of words we're supposed to refer to on these occasions, but what fun is it to write on a topic you haven't fully bought into yet? That's too much like doing a high school report on some esoteric topic like the use of symbolism and imagery in the Dylan Thomas poem Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright. Also, it's called Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night, but who remembers that when there's tigers about? And we're certainly not going to write that paper all over again. We got our A. We're happy to walk away with our laurels on that one. The thing is, the first paragraph usually never makes it into the final version of the show. Instead, we get a good way into the script before finally landing on a topic, and once that happens, we just delete the non-essential, unrelated parts at the start. They're really just a warm-up for what follows. So probably you haven't even heard the bit about Dylan Thomas, and equally as likely, you haven't heard this bit either. But then we'll get to thinking about something we said in passing, something about tigers, probably, and rather than just pass on by, we'll mentally back up and reconsider a thing we said before, realizing some few minutes later that there was some meat on that bone after all, and we should really look more deeply at what we're actually saying. So we'll check Wikipedia, just to assure ourselves that there is something there after all, and familiarize ourselves with the basic facts about whatever the subject is, and as we're writing things down, we'll begin to transition out of the usual introduction structure and start nibbling away at the various facts and figures regarding tigers, while keeping an eye out for those things most likely to be of interest to the listening audience. Also, we like to invent a location for ourselves, though that seems to be a more recent trend because that helps eat up a few words and can sometimes be amusing. At least, that's what the people in charge of washing the screen doors on our enormous GM Word of the Week steampunk submarine tell us. Right about here seems like a good place to introduce our first fact about tigers, so naturally we avoid doing that instead tell you about something interesting we came across in the early research. For instance, did you know that tigers are considered to be charismatic megafauna? What does that even mean? Fortunately, we're more than prepared to tell you this interesting little detail and explain that it describes a number of large animal species to whom we as humans place some sort of significant value due to the way they look or their prominence and symbolic value. In other words, we'd go on, they're no more or less important than any other animal except that we humans tend to like them more than say, and here we come up with an example all our own to illustrate the point, the blood-sucking leech. Or lawyers. Because there are certain rules of comedy which even we must observe. Now, on the surface, you may not immediately see what the problem is with the statement we just made, so we'll helpfully spend the next few paragraphs expanding on the concept and attempt to give you a sufficient enough grounding in the topic to A, brighten up your dinner conversation, and B, maybe see things in a slightly different light. We'll start by dragging in further examples of charismatic megafauna. In addition to the tiger, these include the elephant, the humpback whale, the giant panda, the bald eagle, harp seals, California condors, and penguins. All of which have the benefit of springing readily to the mind, being cute enough in their own way, and immediately garnering our attention whenever they are mentioned. So much so, in fact, that it is a tactic of many environmental organizations to feature these creatures in their fundraising efforts. Many people are much more interested in saving cute and cuddly pandas than they are in saving the endangered squishy pink goo that is a blobfish. More people are worried about their children never getting to see a tiger in its natural habitat than they are about them missing out on seeing a wild Nimba's otter shrew. Of course, we would then be obliged to point out that the problem is significantly more complex than that because not only are we just getting started on page two of a five to six page script, we also want to make it clear that there are multiple sides, versions, or viewpoints to the things we bring up. In this case, the Smithsonian Magazine conducted a study which they summarized in an article titled, When it comes to conservation, are ugly animals a lost cause? 
which we cite in this case because we want you to be able to find it and read it for yourself. We're just going to highlight a few of its points. You should seek it out for further understanding on your own. In the study, they examine the efforts of two conservation organizations, the World Wildlife Fund, which tends to focus its campaign efforts around charismatic megafauna but uses the funds raised to do a variety of things, and the Edge of Existence program of the Zoological Society of London, which tends to highlight and feature less popular but equally as endangered animals from a list of 100 threatened and endangered mammals. To conduct the study, Smithsonian Magazine asked 850 people to rank different photos of endangered animals in order of general appeal. They then compared the results to the efforts of both organizations. For the World Wildlife Fund, they found that an animal's appeal and degree of endangerment most influenced the number and amount of donations received. It made no difference to the WWF donors how the animals were presented. The most appealing and popular ones got the most donations. On the other hand, the Edge of Existence program, while it does feature a few of the animals ranked as most appealing, tends to focus on the less well-known and frankly, less appealing animals. To quote from the relevant article, We found that while people were generally more interested in donating to appealing species, the amount of marketing also made a difference. The animal's edge actively promoted fared better with potential donors, including some homely ones, which we assume they mean the animals and not the donors. Similarly, pitches for the species shown higher up on Edge's site got more donors interested in funding the animal's conservation. What does that mean? We ask rhetorically because we are about to tell you. By partnering with Edge, the magazine was able to run some tests, which found that while the most popular and appealing animals will outfund by up to 10 times as much in donations with no marketing efforts, as shown by WWF and Edge's own programs, by featuring and marketing other, less appealing animals, donations on that animal's behalf could be increased as much as 26 times. Organizations, the article suggests, and we summarize, can increase the assistance they are able to give to less charismatic animals and open up more options simply by putting forth more effort in marketing the animals in need. Marketing, by the way, we clarify, doesn't mean making stuffed plushies and bumper stickers and cute cartoon shows and so on. It isn't as dirty a word as some people like to imply. In this case, it just means making the public more aware of a good service or product, or in this case, of animals in need. But at that point, there is a whole other argument to be made that spreading the massive amounts you get for saving the tigers around to other species like the giant golden mole far outweighs the amount you get for target marketing the giant golden mole itself. Therefore, you can do much more good for many more animals by focusing on the charismatics rather than the uglies. It's not a debate we want or are prepared to get into, though. Mostly because these episodes are meant to run in about 25 minutes or less, and we find ourselves far afield from the initial subject we latched onto. While this part is certainly related, and did come from looking into tigers, it's not specifically about tigers. And besides, we like to toss in a, but we digress, when and where we can. Falling back on taxonomical matters here at the start of page 3, we'll helpfully point out that tigers are one of the five living members of the big cats, which include lions, panthers, leopards, jaguar, and since 2008, the snow leopard. Really, calling them big cats is just another way to refer to the genus name, panthera. But before people start jumping up and down and screaming at their podcast playing devices and fainting, we'll explain that the other cats people often call big cats, namely the puma or cougar, the cheetah, clouded leopards, and the occasional lynx, can be big cats informally, but cannot be members of genus Panthera because they fail classification on one of several fronts. Either they lack spots, lack a roar, or the structure of their skulls is too different, among other criteria, and therefore they fall into classifications of their own. And some of you are still going to shake your fingers at us and start writing corrections, and that's all fine. But we aren't scientists and are doing the best we can to get complex subjects across to the general public. Species-wise, tigers are Panthera tigris, 
and are comprised of two subspecies, Panthera tigris tigris and Panthera tigris sondica. And we could leave it at that, but it would leave out a whole long bit about how no one is actually really sure there are just two subspecies of tiger in the world. See, back in 1758, Carl Linnaeus, the Swedish botanist, zoologist, and physician who came up with this whole binomial nomenclature scheme we use for identifying various plants and animals, decided that the scientific name of tigers should be Felis tigris, putting it squarely in the same genus as your common house cat and some of the other cats not allowed to play any panthera games. Since this was clearly nonsense, British taxonomist Reginald Pocock waited until 1929 to change it to Panthera tigris. And then things just got messier. Really, the problem wasn't so much that people didn't know where the tiger belonged. It was mostly that so few live ones had ever been seen up to that point. Throughout the early 20th century, most tigers were only seen taxidermically, if you see what we mean. Live specimens were hard to come by. So anytime a tiger skin turned up with slightly longer fur, or a bit more orangey color, or the stuffed specimen was smaller than some others, or the stripes were closer together, it was considered to be from a new subspecies. Even though these things occur purely as natural variations within a single population. Still, 111 tiger skulls from around the world were examined, and based on size and other craniological analysis, it was decided that there were actually more species and subspecies of tiger than originally thought. Suddenly there were Tigris tigris from the Asian mainland, and Tigris sundaica from the greater Sunda Islands in the Malay archipelago, meaning Sumatra, Java, Borneo, and Sulawesi. But the skulls of tigers from Sumatra are different from the Javan tiger skulls, but the ones in Bali are about the same size as the Javan ones, and this didn't help clarify matters any because now there were Panthera sumatrae, Panthera sundaica, and Panthera sundaica balica. But no Panthera tigris sundaica, and you can't just go around slapping names on things willy-nilly or no one knows what's going on. And all this is important, we point out, in order to add context and relevancy to a bit of information we've just supplied, for conservation reasons, if nothing else. If there are, say, five distinct species and a further two subspecies of tigers, that requires much different and much more intense conservation efforts than if there are only two main species of tiger. Suddenly, you are essentially trying to preserve three more types, each with their own special circumstances and problems, than you might be if there were only two. You need more money, more time, more resources, and much, much more effort. Finally, at the top of page four, someone decided to do the only sensible thing and threw everything out to start over. In 2015, all tiger species and subspecies that had been proposed underwent thorough testing on a variety of criteria. In the final analysis, it was decided that there was one main and two subtypes of tiger. And in 2017, the Cat Classification Task Force of the International Union for Conservation of Nature Cat Specialist Group revised all the taxonomy and recognized the tigers in continental Asia as Panthera tigris tigris and those in the Sunda Islands as Panthera tigris sundaica. It is mentioned, though, that the two subspecies are composed of numerous subpopulations. Tigris tigris contains the Bengal tiger, the extinct Caspian tiger, Siberian tigers, South China tigers, the Indochinese tiger, and the Malayan tiger, while Tigris sundaica has the Javan tiger, the Bali tiger, and the Sumatran tiger. All of which share, according to the results of genome sequencing, a common ancestor from about 110,000 years ago. Fortunately, we feel no need to talk about ligers and tigons, nor the non-albino white tiger. The first two are hybrids, which is very much frowned upon these days. And the white tiger is just a regular tiger that has a mutant gene that fails to produce the orange color. And other than that, you know what a tiger looks like. Orange, stripy, large fangs, sharp claws, pretty much instant death if you surprise one in the jungle. 
so much instant death that in areas where tigers exist, mythology about tigers also exists. And here we turn to things you could be using in your tabletop RPG. If you didn't particularly think that organizing a party of adventurers to help conserve creatures in your fantasy game world was interesting, or that having your modern setting focus for a time on attempting to classify animals with particularly complicated lineage held much in the way of a subplot. Fair enough. Maybe you didn't even think of it that way, but now you have. In either case, here's the more immediately game-related bits. Tiger mythology. As we said, any culture that came into being near tigers has tiger mythology. No doubt you are familiar with the expression to grab a tiger by the tail. All that means is you have grabbed hold of something terrible and destructive, and you have no convenient way to let go of it without risking life and limb. But many cultures see tigers in a positive light. Tigers were held in equal stead with dragons in many Chinese stories. Where the Chinese dragon, which we've talked about in our Dragon Live show, ruled the air, the Chinese tiger was master of the earth. Although Imperial China often equated the tiger with the personification of war, using it as the symbol for the highest ranking generals. Korean myth regarded the tiger as a guardian that drove out evil spirits and brought good luck, and in the forests of Korea, Tigers were the mountain lord and king of mountain animals. In Buddhism, tigers symbolized anger. The Siberian Tungusic people called the Siberian tiger grandfather or old man. And the Hindu goddess Durga rides Daemon, a tigress, into battle. And of course, as gamers, we're all familiar with the Rakshasa. Because, as we like to remind folks in order to encourage them to look up old episodes, we've already done a Rakshasa episode which you can find on our website at gmwordoftheweek.com or in your usual podcatcher's feed. But there is one other tiger-like creature based on Indian myth and legend that we'd like to touch on. Because it also made an appearance in Dungeons & Dragons, but with much less explanation. Dungeons & Dragons has always had a minor love affair with lycanthropes. So much so that lycanthropy itself became a sort of template you could throw over your character and spec out, thereby allowing you to play a character affected by the curse, having been bitten, presumably against your will, by a werewolf or similar creature. Although, there was always that one player who insisted that lycanthropy was merely another facet of their character when compared to the half-dragon vampiric demilich celestial they were already playing, and why won't you allow it, you tyrant? Honestly, if it's gone that far already, what's one more template? It's either that or a full can of lighter fluid. Weird Tigers appeared in the game as early as 1974's White Box and remained a pretty consistent presence up to and including 5th edition. Ever since it appeared as a playable character race in Dragon Magazine number 24 in 1979, people have been trying to reintroduce it as such in each subsequent edition through templates and adventure modules or subsequent magazine articles. Which is funny, considering they aren't even lycanthropes and so don't really qualify for the template they ended up as. See, we've pointed out before that lycanthropy specifically refers to wolves. The original Greek literally means wolf person. There's no two ways about it. Weird tigers are not lycanthropes. However, a third of the way through page 5, we're prepared to introduce you to some new vocabulary. If you wanted, say, a catch-all word to represent all the creatures which are human most of the time but shapeshift into animals or animal-like creatures under certain conditions, then there is, in fact, a word that means exactly that. Theraanthropy. From the Greek therian, meaning wild animal or beast, and of course, anthropos, meaning human being. That covers about every animal you could want to transform into, though it should be said, if you only want to change your head into that of an animal, you probably really want the word theriocephaly. You know, like all those Egyptian gods. With all that said, you can still be more specific. Aileranthropy is exactly the term you want. Greek aileros means cat, and that's as exactly descriptive as you can get. You could maybe stretch to tigraanthropy for maximum specificity, but then you'd have to credit us for coining the term since it appears no one else has. And who wants to do that? In any case, 
Once you accept that the folks at TSR knew about Rakshasa, it's not hard to see how they arrived at including the Weir Tiger. It's like a Rakshasa rolled back one step. In India, they were dangerous, potentially man-eating sorcerers who threatened livestock. Some Chinese thought Weir Tigers were people who had been cursed either by a ghost or because a former ancestor had been cursed so hard that even his grandchildren were cursed. Others thought that the evil spirits of those who had been killed by tigers became spirits known as Chang that were destined to make sure more people were killed and eaten by tigers and helped by turning more other people into man-eating weird tigers to make it happen. And according to the folklore of Thailand, tigers that eat too many humans were destined to become weird tigers themselves. Various video games have also tapped into the weird tiger mythology in various ways. Altered Beast and Breath of Fire 3 have characters who are or can become weird tigers, and the Fire Emblem game has an entire tribe of folks who can turn into weird tigers and other Eluranthropes. Just to mention a few. The problem now, of course, is that we've written nearly five pages of stuff about tigers and weird tigers and conservation efforts and other assorted things, and it's getting close to the point where we have to begin wrapping this whole episode up in some nice and succinct way, because if we don't, we're just going to dump out into the end credits and it'll feel pretty abrupt. You probably wouldn't enjoy it. But what can you say that ties a neat ribbon around all this stuff? There isn't much. Except, if we were particularly clever, we could turn this into a meta-episode about episodes and how they get written and the effort that goes into the research and writing of one of these things. And then, as the finale of the whole thing, we could point out that all this time and effort is entirely supported by fans and listeners like you on our Patreon. We could tell you that for as little as a dollar, you can get transcripts of each episode and early access as the episodes are finished. For $5, you could join our Discord and sit in on a monthly chat and occasional live stream of show production. And for the entirely reasonable sum of $10, you get all that and access to a monthly bonus episode of stuff that didn't get put in the regular show. Furthermore, we'd also be able to mention that you can get all this by going to patreon.com slash GM Word of the Week or following the link in the show description. But by then we'd be on page six and should probably stop. This has been GM Word of the Week. It's written and researched by the Angry GM and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash GM Word of the Week. You can find more at gmwordoftheweek.com and theangrygm.com. <laughs>